Johnson's first action as majority leader was making committee assignments. Johnson would use unanimous consent agreement, a procedural device in the Senate that limited the amount of time a bill could be debated, to evenly divide time between a bill's proponents and opponents, place the allocation of time under control of both proponents and opponents of the measure, and limited the number of amendments to a bill, how much time each amendment could be debated, and whether to place that time under specific senator's control. Caro explains, it wasn't a new instrument. First employed in 1845, it had been formally embodied in the Senate Rules, Rule 12, Paragraph 3, since 1914, and previous Senate leaders had used it in a number of different ways. Never, however, had it been used as this leader used it. His use of it was, in fact, perhaps the most striking example of the creativity that Lyndon Johnson brought to the legislative process. When Johnson made agreements with a senator, he or Reedy or Siegel would take notes on the details of the agreement and formally type up the notes. Assistant parliamentarian Riddick remembered, Johnson wanted everything written to back him up as a record. He would get us, the parliamentarians, to sign the damn thing. He wanted it written down so he would be able to say if anyone objected, well, you gave me this power. Johnson would go to senators with the formal document and express his desire that they not object, purposefully making it difficult for disagreement, as he would say other senators had already agreed and they couldn't afford to waste time on this bill. By June 1955, unanimous consent agreements became, as Howard Sherman observed, the standard operating procedure on all big Senate bills, and Sherman furthered that debates, aside from sparse allotment of time, became a favor senators would have to request from the majority leader. Carroll writes, in what had once been called the greatest deliberative body in the world, there was now very little real deliberation. So creative was Lyndon Johnson's political genius that it had transformed every political institution of which he had been the leader. Now it had transformed the United States Senate, remade that body seemingly so immutable in his own image. He could run it now, run it as he wanted to run it. A journalist remembered he would stand there very erect, so tall and confident, just a model of a take-charge man. Johnson also deviated from other majority leaders in not being accompanied by assistants when speaking to reporters because, as Carroll puts it, he didn't need any. He knew the details himself. The file folder that Siegel had prepared contained the day's agenda, the calendar of bills, with notes on senators' views about various bills, and brief statements Johnson was to give. In the memory of the reporters who met with him regularly, Lyndon Johnson never not once opened that folder. Johnson brought some touches to the role of leader for dramatic effect. Bobby Baker recalling his shows as carefully orchestrated and perhaps even a shade melodramatic and calling LBJ not only a fine actor, but a fine director and producer as well, who delighted in striding through the Senate floor. Baker was adamant that there was nothing wrong with Johnson's trickeries, furthering that Lyndon Johnson knew that the illusion of power was almost as important as real power itself, that simply the more powerful you appear to be, the more powerful you became. It was one of the reasons for his great success. Carroll writes, some of the more perceptive journalists realized that some of the drama they were reporting was stage drama. Lyndon Johnson played leader, City says, but he played the part well. Played it better, far better than anyone had ever played it before. Played it as if he was made for it, as if he'd been born for the role. And however he got the power, he got it. Doris Kearns Goodwin was not the only writer who was to call Lyndon Johnson the master of the Senate because that was what he was. Dalek writes that LBJ's effectiveness as minority leader suggested that he might prove to be a cut above earlier majority leaders, but the slim two-vote Democratic margin in the Senate and a popular Republican president added to the normal limitations a Democratic floor leader faced in making much of a legislative record. In December, Adley Stevenson installed Paul Butler as chairman of the Democratic National Committee, the latter beginning his tenure by attacking Eisenhower and publicly supporting a separate Democratic legislative agenda. Johnson believed the Democratic nominee in the 1956 presidential election would fare better than Stevenson had if he could point to a record of principled stands on principled issues by the Democratic Party rather than partisan tactics. In January 1955, 
Rayburn proposed a tax cut for every man, woman, and child across the country. Rayburn wanted a tax reduction that would both benefit the mass of Americans and give Democrats talking points in the 1956 election. The Eisenhower administration responded to the bill by claiming it would cost the government $2.3 billion a year and unbalance the budget. While the bill was able to narrowly get through the House, it was opposed in the Senate by both conservative Democrats and Republicans alike. Johnson sponsored a modified version of Rayburn's plan in the Senate with a less far-reaching tax cut, $20 tax cut for the heads of households, $10 for dependents, and nothing for spouses. In a March 18th vote, five conservative Democrats joined 45 Republicans in defeating Johnson's tax plan. According to Eisenhower aide Bryce Harlow, Johnson had a special gift, an undefinable talent for leadership that created fear, admiration, and a desire in others to follow. Johnson operated from a back room in the Capitol as he made committee appointments in 1955, making over 200 phone calls to touch all bases and conferring the most with Russell, George, Symington, and Humphrey. Johnson was certain to tell other senators what he did for them, with telephone calls reporting steering committee decisions being a way of driving home the point. LBJ also sent senators favorable press releases about their committee appointments, with a note encouraging them to distribute it in any way they deemed would be an advantage for themselves. Johnson's success leading a closely divided Senate through a productive session stirred talks of his suitability for higher office with publications such as Newsweek, The New Republic, and The Washington Post speculating on Johnson becoming the Democratic Party nominee in either the 1956 or 1960 presidential elections. Believing positive discussions about him a year in advance the Democratic Convention could impede his Senate work, Johnson denied any interest in running. He also suffered a serious heart attack around this time. Johnson usually woke at 6.30 in the morning and ate breakfast in bed as he skimmed through the congressional record of the previous day. An exchange with veteran journalist John Chadwick on the McCarran walter immigration law caused Johnson, who was chain-smoking to soothe his jaws, to abruptly end the conference. Leaving the Senate, Johnson went to Walter George at the Mayflower and after crossing the Potomac, broke out in a cold sweat as he felt pain in his midsection and chest. He later arrived at the home of George Brown, who gave him some anti-acid and later some digitalis, neither of which helped and the latter could have killed Johnson. Senator Clint Anderson, who previously had a heart attack himself, arrived at the house and upon hearing Lyndon's complaint shouted, My God, man, you're having a heart attack! An ambulance was called to rush Lyndon to the Bethesda Naval Hospital, Fearing he would die before reaching the hospital, Johnson stated his wish that Lady Bird receive everything. Johnson asked the doctor, Will I ever be able to smoke again if this is a heart attack? The doctor replied, Well, Senator, frankly, no. To that point, Johnson sighed and said, I'd rather have my pecker cut off. His condition improved after the first 48 hours. Well, Senator, you look like you just won an election. Do you feel that good, sir? Well, I feel pretty good. I'm going to feel better after two or three months in Texas. I'm going home to get a long rest, and I hope I'll come back uh, refreshed and rejuvenated. What are you going to uh, do in Texas? Well, the first uh, 10 days I'm down there, I'm going to be on vacation. Then I'm going to get me a great big rocking chair and put on my front porch, and the rest of the time I'm just going to sit and rock and think. I hope to uh, come back to Atlanta in December and then to go out to Mayo's in Minnesota uh, from Atlanta. And if the doctors uh, give me the okay, I'll be back on the job uh, in Senate uh, when the Senate reconvenes in January. In the meantime, no politics and on to the rocking chair. Well, I wouldn't say that uh, you could take politics completely away from me, but uh, we'll have it at a minimum. Good thing. Good, thing. Well, good, good luck. Thank all of you for being so nice to me. The majority leader received an outpouring of sympathy and encouragement from family, friends, fellow politicians, journalists, and the public. Mary Rather remembered it was way out in the country, and it was so quiet and still. The awareness of his very bad heart attack made it such a, a long, sad time. He had slowed down so much. And the days were so long because we took very few phone calls. We had hardly any visitors. And you knew that this worry about his health was on his mind and Lady Bird's mind every day.
plus the big decisions about what to do about being a member of Congress and what to do with his life if he didn't return to Congress. Johnson brought his weight down from 220 to 177 pounds. George Reedy recalling Johnson's having become the goddamnest diet fanatic that ever lived. Toward the end of September, Adley Stevenson and Sam Rayburn visited Johnson's ranch, where the three held a press conference that brought Johnson back into the national spotlight. Stevenson, Rayburn, and Johnson were cited as the big three in reference to the trio being seen as the three most powerful men in the Democratic Party, and the conference left the impression that Johnson had largely recovered. By 1955, the minimum wage of 75 cents had not been increased in six years, nor had its coverage, which liberals sought to expand to low-paid employees in retail and service industries. The Eisenhower administration proposal to increase it to 90 cents an hour without broadening coverage had earned rebuke from conservative senators, and it was believed the bill, coming out of a committee chaired by Paul Douglas, would be broadened to a dollar and 25 cents. Johnson's strategy, which Carroll terms playing on the worst fears of both sides, entailed telling liberals that he had counted the votes, and if they did not settle for 90 cents, there would be no increase at all. Alternatively, Johnson told conservatives that he had counted the votes, and if they did not settle for 90 cents, the minimum wage might be increased to $1.25. A Senate aide remembered, the cloakroom was just jammed. We knew what he was telling both sides. But there was just enough credibility in it. He was a master. Johnson said, Mr. President, I yield back the remainder of my time. A voice vote was taken, which was followed by the chair announcing the bill had passed. Labor Committee Chairman Lister Hill was in the cloakroom at the time, unaware the vote was taking place. The same could be said of Herbert Lehman and Shepsert Holland. The latter came charging out, jumping, screaming, hollering, and pounding the desk. Johnson told Holland, well, Spessard, I had a little vote. If you fellows aren't on the job around here, I've got legislation to pass. Although both sides were angered, the liberal side's fury evaporated when they realized the minimum wage increase had not only finally been achieved, but that the increase was even higher than the 90 cent proposal of the Eisenhower administration. Carroll writes, the last time a minimum wage bill had been before the Senate, Lyndon Johnson had voted against increasing it. Now he had fought for an increase in the wage, and the wage had been increased. Whatever the reason for his change on that issue, he had changed, and had made the Senate change with him. Whether or not Lyndon Johnson talked about principled things or believed in principled things, and in both the public housing and minimum wage fights, he had all but ignored the issues and concentrated on maneuvers, he had won principled things, for hundreds of thousands of Americans who needed those things. The slickness of Johnson's maneuver had senators laughing among themselves as they walked out of the chamber, but the liberals had much more reason to laugh. Lyndon Johnson had not only made the Senate work, he had in at least two areas of social welfare legislation made it work on behalf of that legislation. For so many decades, generations, the Senate had stood against such legislation like a dam. The dam was being breached now. A short time afterward, Johnson fell into a depression, which doctors observed as common among heart attack victims, but unusually severe in LBJ's case. Baker said that after meeting with Johnson, he found a quiet and sober man who talked of how close he'd come to death, of how he would be forced to curtail his activities, of how he might no longer be able to act as Senate Majority Leader, Thousands of letters poured into Johnson's office from friends and public, with Lady Bird reading them to him as he initially showed little response before deciding they would respond to all of them. It was forwarded to Johnson by Dr. Gibson that he needed to stop smoking. Johnson is described as tearing the wrapper off a pack of cigarettes, opening the pack and pulling one cigarette halfway out before putting the pack on the night table next to his hospital bed where it remained untouched throughout the rest of his hospital stay. A few years later, Johnson was asked by a secretary if he missed smoking, responding every minute of every day. Johnson would not smoke again until 1970, after his public career had ended, at which point he resumed his copious smoking. Tommy Corcoran visited Johnson at his ranch, recounting that Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. had wanted him to tell LBJ that if he publicly entered the race for the 1956 presidential nomination and privately agreed to place his son, 
Massachusetts Senator John F. Kennedy as his running mate if he won. Then he would arrange the ticket's financing. Carroll writes, This offer revealed at least two drastic underestimations on the ambassador's part. First, about the extent of Johnson's own financing, and second, about Johnson's political acumen. No sooner were the words of the offer out of his mouth, Corcoran saw, than Johnson understood the reasoning behind it. Joe Kennedy was betting that Eisenhower would run again, in which case he would, of course, win again. The Democratic vice presidential nomination would give young, relatively unknown Jack Kennedy the national recognition he needed to give him a running start at the 1960 presidential nomination, and it would be more desirable for that candidacy to be a Johnson rather than a Stevenson ticket. Adley, old Joe felt, would lose in a landslide, and an overwhelming defeat would be attributed partially to the Catholicism of his running mates, a belief which would damage Kennedy's chances in 1960. Johnson, the ambassador believed, would lose, but in a much closer race. Although Johnson did not believe JFK could win in 1960, viewing him as having never said a word of importance in the Senate, and he never did a thing, he did not want to improve Kennedy's chances and did not want his 1956 candidacy made public either. Johnson's declining of the offer infuriated Robert F. Kennedy, who thought it was unforgivably discourteous of LBJ to turn down the generous offer of his father. This is believed to be the inciting incident that caused the long-standing LBJ-RFK political feud. LBJ's treatment of his staff was changed by his heart attack. His doctors had warned him that tension and anger were the biggest threats to a heart attack victim, and thus he reduced his indulgence and anger at his subordinates. Walter Jenkins remembered he became less hard to get along with. Up to that time, when things didn't go just to suit him, he had a tendency to fly off the handle at little things. It seemed to me that he was able to ignore these things more after the heart attack. The opening of the 1956 session of Congress saw Johnson return to what Carroll calls a place where he had found so much of those commodities as he was ever likely to find anywhere. James H. Rowe, a political insider who had known Johnson for nearly 20 years, recalled the senator using whatever he could to gain sympathy from people as a means of getting what he wanted from them. Rowe had refused to join Johnson's staff due to his awareness of how LBJ treated those on his payroll, and the first week of January saw Johnson renew his overtures with a new twist. He told others that Rowe was cruel for turning down helping a man at death's door. Rowe recalled, People I knew were coming up to me on the street, on the street, and saying, Why aren't you helping Lyndon? Don't you know how sick he is? How can you let him down when he needs you? Johnson later came to Rowe's office, pleading for his help as he cried. However, as soon as Rowe agreed, Johnson straightened up, changed his tone from pleading to cold command, and said, Just remember, I make the decisions. You don't. Johnson also used his heart attack to persuade senators, with Bobby Baker reminding some of them that they shouldn't upset the majority leader as he was a sick man and they should try making things easier for him. These arguments were resonant in 1956 due to the deaths of Harley Kilgore and Albin Barkley and the retirement of Eugene Milliken after coming to the Senate in a wheelchair because of an illness that he called arthritis, but that his colleagues suspected was something worse. On February 3rd, Senator Francis Chase of South Dakota rose from his desk, announcing a lobbyist for a natural gas company had left an envelope containing 25 $100 bills in his campaign headquarters. Case said that while he would have voted for the bill, he was voting against it as to object to doing something so valuable to those interested in natural gas that they advance huge sums of money as a down payment, so to speak on the profits they expect to harvest. LBJ's initial reaction was to impugn the senator's story by casting doubts on the truth of his story, saying, Thus far, Senator Case has declined to reveal the name of the man who left the money. Unless the senator from South Dakota voluntarily divulges the name of the fellow, and the impropriety, if any, the Senate is going to investigate. After Case gave Neff's name and the envelope containing the money, Johnson switched to impugning Case's motives. 
telling reporters that the timing of the revelation was an attempt to sabotage the natural gas bill, despite Case being a supporter of the bill and reporting the contribution right after he realized it was connected to the bill. The Rules Committee Chairman Hennings was a former district attorney. He pledged that his subcommittee would begin a thorough and complete look into the case matter and every other damn matter in connection with it and get at the big boys if we can. Carroll writes, Lyndon Johnson could not allow such an investigation. The big boys in question were his big boys, Herman and George, and Sid and Clint, and the other oil men with whose lobbying efforts he had been so closely connected. They were Ed Clark and John Connolly, who had worked right out of his office. Any thorough and complete investigation could hardly help turning up his name. It had to be stopped. Johnson pleaded with Hennings to restrict his subcommittee's investigation to one contribution, pulling out all the stops as he insisted the agitation over the natural gas fight was making his heart act up again, and that his doctor was threatening to put him on digitalis again. Hennings said, I felt as though I was being cast in the role of a murderer, and as soon as the Senate next convened, Johnson and Nolan introduced a resolution establishing a select committee for contribution investigation. Its members, including Democrats Walter George and Carl Hayden, and Republicans Edward Thigh and Stiles Bridges, it specified the committee was to investigate the circumstances surrounding the alleged improper contribution in the case and no others. In 1955, the House passed a bill changing the nature of the Social Security system for the first time since 1939, lowering the age at which women began collecting benefits and providing payments of benefits to disabled persons of both genders at the age of 50. The proposal transforming Social Security from a retirement and survivor's benefit plan into a vehicle for much broader social welfare programs, including the program that was the longtime dream of liberals and labor and the longtime nightmare of many doctors. Social Security financed federal health insurance. While the Eisenhower administration backed the Social Security bill, it thought the disability reform was too far reaching. Johnson decided to fight for the bill since Eisenhower would have trouble vetoing a Social Security bill in an election year. Dalek writes, the fact that it would benefit disabled Americans, bring federal health insurance for the elderly closer to realization, and give Democrats a political victory made the measure particularly appealing to Lyndon. Johnson convinced Kerr to drop the bill's disability provision and persuaded Walter George that supporting the disability provision would benefit the Democrats in the next election with the differing view on Social Security from Republicans. Conservative Republicans opposed enlarging the scope of Social Security, and Republican Senator George W. Malone was among those conservatives, and at the same time was proposing a guarantee of $69 million or more in federal purchases from Nevada's tungsten mines. Johnson told him he would get Malone the votes for his measure in exchange for Malone's vote in favor of the Social Security Disability Amendment the latter agreeing to the bargain. The support of Malone made the count on Social Security a tie of 46 to 46, with Johnson needing one more vote from Earl Clements. Although Clements was loyal to Johnson, he was facing a tough re-election contest and had previously promised not to support the disability amendment. Clements needed money for his campaign beyond what Kentucky could provide, and LBJ promised some from Texas and there would be more before telling him he might need Clements' support for the disability amendment. Clements was the decisive vote for the amendment, and Johnson gave him more money for his campaign, with Clements losing to his opponent Morton by a margin of less than 5,000 votes. Evans and Novak wrote that the vote Clements made to accommodate Johnson infuriated the doctors and resulted in their organized opposition to his re-election. As Baker would later observe, Senator Clements had made a commitment to Senator Johnson that although it would destroy him politically, which it did, if he broke his word, which he did, that he would vote with us. Carroll writes, the senator's approval by a 47 to 45 vote of the disability amendment to the Social Security Act showed Lyndon Johnson's power at, in the case of Molly Malone, its most subtle, and at, in the case of Earl Clements, its most raw. And that approval showed also the extent of his power documented again that the Senate, a body designed so that it would never have a master, had a master now. But the Senate was not what Lyndon Johnson wanted. 
It was only a step on the ladder to the goal, the only goal of which he had dreamed. So he had at last to come to grips with his greatest dilemma, which was also America's greatest dilemma, the plight of the 16 million Americans whose skin were black. In the summer of 1955, LBJ had devised that the surest way to the presidency was becoming the Democratic Party nominee in 1956, believing that even if Eisenhower ran again and won, the nomination would make him the standard bearer for his party in 1960. Dalek writes that LBJ saw a Senate fight over civil rights legislation in 1956 as a losing proposition for the country, the Democrats, and himself, but the pressures from the first months of the year to consider some response were irresistible. Eisenhower administration attorney general Herbert Brownell had been a civil rights advocate fighting the scourge of segregation as a member of the New York State Legislature with his support of a Fair Employment Act with powers to ensure compliance. Carroll writes that Brownell had been frustrated over the administration's hands being tied by a failure of federal jurisdiction in the Emmett Till case and other areas in which black Americans had supposedly been guaranteed the equal rights of their white counterparts. Brownell drafted a bill that would give the U.S. Attorney General powers to enforce civil rights in housing, parks, theaters, restaurants, hotels, and motels, as well as not having to wait for individuals to sue to be able to act first. Missouri Senator Hennings introduced four civil rights bills that were sent to the Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights, the bills afterward being sent to the Judiciary Committee. It was understood that while the bills would likely pass due to Chairman Harley Kilgore, they would die in the Senate due to the South. But according to Caro, this faction of senators would not be able to kill them quietly, but only after a highly public floor fight it was anxious to avoid. Kilgore died at the end of February from a stroke and was replaced by James O. Eastland of Missouri, one of the Senate's most vocal opponents of civil rights. Another threat born out of the escalating civil rights conflict threatened Johnson's prospects of winning the 1956 Democratic nomination. The Brown ruling had infuriated Southern senators, causing South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond, with help from Virginia's Harry Byrd, to write a proclamation that would guide their region's future, dubbed by the press as the Southern Manifesto. The manifesto called on the South to resist the Brown decision, and its signatories included 19 senators and 81 representatives from the 11 states that formed the Confederacy. Carroll writes, the Southern Manifesto and Herbert Brownell's Civil Rights Bill menaced from opposite sides, Lyndon Johnson's master plan. Manifesto and Bill both threatened to add kindling to the civil rights issue on Capitol Hill. Johnson's strategy for winning his party's presidential nomination to hold his Southern support while antagonizing Northern liberals as little as possible, or at least not antagonizing them any more than he already had, was feasible only if the issue did not blaze up on the Hill, since if it did, he would have to take his position prominently on the Southern side. For his strategy to work, the civil rights issue had to be tamped down in Congress, his involvement with it minimized. Johnson declared he had not signed the manifesto because he had not seen it, nor been shown it by the other Southerners. Russell made it easy for Johnson to avoid signing the manifesto because of what he wanted for him, with Russell biographer Gilbert C. Fitt writing, Russell was much more interested in pushing Johnson for president, which he was then doing, than having another name on the manifesto. Carroll writes, the Brownell bill, now before the House Judiciary Committee, was a very different story. Dodging the manifesto had been easy for Johnson. It was only a symbol, a rallying cry. The bill was substance, hard substance, broad in scope and skillfully drawn. Its passage would revolutionize the treatment of Negroes in America. It had to be stopped. It had to be stopped, furthermore, before it reached the Senate floor. Johnson blocked efforts by Paul Douglas to get a discussion on the Brownell bill and later called for a voice vote that saw 76 senators vote against Douglas. Joe Ra would later say, this was the dirtiest trick Johnson ever played. It was just Johnson putting his foot on Douglas's face. Talk of the 1956 nomination continued. Carroll writes, Rayburn, loyal as ever despite his desire not to split the party with the divisive convention fight, said firmly that he was supporting Johnson, but he tried to let the younger man of whom he was so fond know that while he would certainly get the nomination in 1960, 
there was no realistic possibility of his getting it this year. Johnson knew he needed Russell to shore up the South support of Stevenson, but the Georgia senator was interested in attending the convention, preferring to go somewhere with no telephones. Johnson repeatedly told reporters that he was not a serious candidate, only a favorite son who would not seek any Texas delegates. LBJ reminded the press of his heart problems, saying, Eisenhower may have forgotten he had a heart attack. I have not. Mine still hurts. Carroll furthers that it was important to Johnson to not be seen as a sectional candidate in the same vein of Russell in 1952. Harry Byrd pleaded for Johnson to run, telling him that if he declared his candidacy, he would never have to worry of Virginia again. Former President Truman announced his endorsement of Harriman for the Democratic nomination. Truman's influence had waned, but it was assumed that his selection of Harriman would stifle Stevenson's ability to get the 687 and a half votes on the first or early ballot. Johnson was among those who assumed this, having devised the previous year that the convention would have to turn to a compromise candidate and that he would be a logical choice, given that there was a block of almost 300 Southern and Southwestern delegates. This made his chances of winning the nomination seem possible again for the majority leader. Wednesday, Connolly placed LBJ's name for contention. Around this time, Russell warned, Lyndon, don't ever let yourself become a sectional candidate for the presidency. That was what happened to me. During the balloting on Thursday evening, most favorite sons withdrew in support of Stevenson, and at the end of the first and only roll call vote, the figures on the big screen were stark. Stevenson, 905 and a half votes. Harriman, 210 votes. Johnson, 80 votes. Texas delegate Jerry Holloman recalled, it became obvious before the first roll call was over that Adley Stevenson was going to be the nominee. The Texas delegation wanted to switch over from Lyndon and change its vote, cast its final vote for Stevenson to be on the bandwagon. They were after John Connolly, and John was on the phone talking to Lyndon, desperately trying to get Lyndon's permission to let them ask for the floor to switch their vote. Johnson did not oblige, and his actions at the 1956 convention would puzzle those who knew him for years. John Connolly remembered 1956 as being in the era when politicians believed in spontaneous forces, that delegates could be stampeded in the 11th hour draft, in a deadlock convention turning to a compromised candidate. Carroll writes that Connolly's viewpoint was reflected by a reporter who wrote that year that Johnson was waiting for an explosion to overturn Stevenson and send him into presidential contention. Johnson was asked at a press conference if he wanted to be vice president and he would not definitively decline serving. Johnson instructed Rowe to tell Stevenson that no Texan wanted to be vice president and that he himself only wanted to be present at the meeting where the running mate was selected. Rao returned from meeting Stevenson and revealed that Stevenson had decided to throw the choice of his running mate to the convention. This infuriated Rayburn and Johnson, the former believing that Stevenson was throwing the party and convention to turmoil after all his work to unite them, and the two feared an open convention meant that Kufafer would win. Stopping Kufafer was the South's number one priority, and Johnson huddled with leaders of the Southern delegation to determine which candidates would best be able to defeat him so the South could unite behind that man. Johnson's first choice to prevent Kufafer's nomination was Humphrey, but he worried the liberal choice would antagonize his conservative Texas financial backers and doubtful Southern senators would support someone so firmly in favor of civil rights. He suggested a Texas vote for Tennessee Governor Frank Clement, who would later be swapped out for Humphrey. Rayburn took the gavel to order the convention that afternoon, and Johnson received a shock when Clement announced he had withdrawn. Johnson next suggested Al Gore, another Tennessean, but when the first ballot ended, Kufafer had 483 votes to Kennedy's 304, making it clear the race was between two men and neither of LBJ's suggested candidates had made it. Rayburn and Johnson favored Kennedy over Kufafer, and the former surged ahead of Kufafer on the second ballot with Gore far behind both of them. Gore announced he would withdraw in favor of Kufafer, and this gave Kufafer a majority sealing his nomination. Johnson had failed to stop either Stevenson or Kufafer, two men he disliked and despised. Carroll writes, Before the convention, Lyndon Johnson had been almost universally portrayed as an enormously powerful and influential figure in the Democratic Party. By the end of the convention, 
it had become obvious that this portrait was overdrawn. His image as a brilliant political strategist had also been smudged. Lyndon Johnson's reputation as an uncommonly astute Senate leader remains unimpaired, but the fact has been established, as it was not before, that in the jungle of national convention, he cannot employ the gifts he uses in the Senate, Richard Revere wrote in The New Yorker. He had, in fact, looked almost foolish. Before the convention opened, summarized the Washington Post and Times Herald, it had been expected that Stevenson would have to make bargains if he hoped to win the nomination. He would have to deal with the kingmaker, Senator Lyndon Johnson of Texas, who was expected to corral a huge block of Southern delegates and tie them up until he got what he wanted. Adley would have to be a supplicant and give Johnson his way with respect to a civil rights plank and a vice presidential nomination. Of course, it didn't turn out that way. Send Johnson, so his friends say, was carried away for a while with a vision of himself in the White House. At any rate, he waited too long to play his cards as a kingmaker. The idea that Adley would have to make concessions to send Johnson seemed a fantastic one in the storm of ballots and acclaim tonight. This great maneuverer from Texas has been outmaneuvered, the Wall Street Journal said. Stevenson lost his rematch with Eisenhower, and the president won Texas again. Dalek writes, despite the Texas vote for Eisenhower, Johnson emerged from the 1956 election as the Democratic Party's dominant national figure. While the Eisenhower landslide had buried Stevenson, it had left the Democratic congressional majorities intact and made Rayburn and Johnson the party's undisputed leaders. More than ever, a successful presidential bid by Lyndon seemed to be a realistic possibility, but nothing could be taken for granted. Lyndon needed some kind of track record in foreign affairs and the accommodation with party liberals if he were to make an effective bid for the 1960 nomination. By September, Egypt had nationalized the Swiss Canal, and unrest erupted in Poland and Hungary after the publication of Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev's speech denouncing Stalin, both events heightening American interest in world affairs. Johnson chose to attend a NATO meeting in Paris and stated his intentions to visit the fence installations in Germany as well as working to strengthen the mutual defense system that had been strained by recent developments. Dalek writes that Johnson did not want to abandon the bipartisanship that he viewed as beneficial to the country and congressional Democrats during Eisenhower's first term, but pressure from liberals, congressional prerogative defenses, and differences over Middle East policy prompted his conflict with Eisenhower. Johnson tabled a motion by Clinton Anderson that would have ended the filibuster through imposing a cloture with the consent of a simple majority. This provoked outrage with the New York Post writing, once again, democracy has taken a beating in the halls of the United States Senate. It was a bad day for the cause of freedom, the unholy alliance of Southern Democrats and Midwestern Republicans. Carroll writes, this liberal anger certainly appeared justified. In fighting for the filibuster, Lyndon Johnson had seemingly only been doing in early January 1957 what he had done so many times before. It was only natural for liberals who for 20 years had seen Lyndon Johnson standing squarely on the side of the South and against civil rights to assume that during the rest of 1957 he would be standing on the same side again, but he wouldn't. During Lyndon Johnson's previous political life, compassion had constantly been in conflict with ambition, and invariably ambition had won. Given the imperatives of his nature in such a conflict, it had been inevitable that the ambition would win. For the compassion to be released, to express itself in concrete accomplishments, it would have to be compatible with the ambition, pointing in the same direction, and now, at last, in 1957, it was. So Lyndon Johnson changed, and changed the course of of American history, for at last this leader of men would be leading, fighting, not only for himself but for a greater cause. This man who in the pursuit of his aims could be so utterly ruthless, who would let nothing stand in his way, who in the pursuit, deceived and betrayed and cheated, would be deceiving and betraying and cheating on behalf of something other than himself, specifically on behalf of the 16 million Americans whose skin were dark. All through Lyndon Johnson's political life as congressman and senator, as congressman's secretary, 
and NYA director, there had been striking evidence not only of compassion, but of something that could make compassion meaningful. Signs of a most unusual capacity, a very rare gift for using the powers of government to help the downtrodden and the dispossessed. This capacity had always been held in check by his quest for power. Now he had the power, power reveals. The compassion that had been hidden was to be released now in full. Did those 16 million Americans need a mighty champion in the halls of government? They were about to get one. Dalek notes that men as varied as Jim Rowe and Richard Russell understood that LBJ could not become president unless he did something important to protect black rights in the South. Dalek also observes that the significant shift of black votes from Democratic to Republican in the 1956 elections, the need for unity between Northern and Southern Democrats on civil rights to mute it as a divisive issue in party affairs, and the Eisenhower administration's support of a civil rights bill demonstrating that the South could no longer rely on Republicans to block reforms influenced Johnson's support of a civil rights law in 1957. Halfway through January, Reports circulated that Russell formed a secret meeting where LBJ told the Southern Caucus of a timetable for action on a civil rights bill. It is believed that some of the Southern senators who supported Johnson thought that if he became president, he would have no choice but to do something about racial discrimination, and they could count on him to do as little as possible. Carroll writes, whether or not Lyndon Johnson was already planning in 1957 to take giant steps towards racial justice if he ever became president, we do not know and perhaps no one will ever know. But whether or not in 1957 he was misleading the Southern senators deliberately, misled they certainly were. Did he intend to mislead them? We don't know. But if we take him at his word, his word that at Cotilla, I swore then and there that if I ever had a chance to help those underprivileged kids, I was going to do it, then Lyndon Johnson was misleading the Southern senators deliberately. To whatever extent Johnson in 1957 was already planning, at least an outline, the things he would do if he ever became president, he was planning to betray and to betray on a very large scale the men, some of them very clever men, who were for years not only his most loyal, but his most important supporters. Civil rights didn't get accomplished by idealism, but by rough stuff. That was the lesson that Catherine Graham had taken away from her visit to Lyndon Johnson's ranch. What Johnson was doing now with the Southern Caucus, in the service of both his great ambition and his great purpose, was rough stuff indeed. But a civil rights bill had to be passed, and a civil rights bill was going to be passed. According to Carroll, Johnson believed that the most important thing was not what was in the bill, but rather that there was a bill. The South had won so many times that senators believed the South could not lose, particularly on civil rights. Carroll furthers, a victory over the South would begin destroying this mystique, demonstrate that the South could be beaten and more attempts would be made to beat it. Johnson saw this as Roe and Corcoran and Reedy and others close to him in 1957 attest. He used a typically earthly phrase to explain it. Once you break the virginity, he said, it'll be easier next time. Pass one civil rights bill, no matter how weak, and others would follow. And there was a further reason. Lyndon Johnson saw why the passage of any civil rights bill, no matter how weak, would be a crucial gain for civil rights. Once a bill was passed, it could later be amended. Altering something was a lot easier than creating it. Aware though he became after his return to Washington following the 1957 Easter recess that his only slim hope of passing a civil rights bill would be to amend it down into a very weak bill. Johnson nonetheless realized that however insignificant the bill's provisions, passage of the measure would be deeply significant, not only for his personal dreams, but for the dreams of the 16 million American citizens whose skin were black. Johnson tried for weeks to get the Douglas Group to accept a drastically weaker version of Part 3 as part of an effort to get the first one, breaking what he called the virginity of the Senate on civil rights. The liberals saw Part 3 as the most essential part of the bill, as it enabled the Attorney General to strike an injustice directly. Carroll explains, without Part 3, the South could still say never to school desegregation. There had been no legal recourse against the men who killed Emmett Till. Was there to be no recourse the next time a black body was pulled out of a river? The South was continuing to deny black Americans their rights, even in spheres in which courts had ruled. 
although blacks could now sit in the fronts of buses in Montgomery, Alabama, when in June of 1957, a black minister had tried to do that in Georgia, he had been arrested and jailed. Justice had been denied to black Americans for centuries, these senators felt, were they, by agreeing to amend Part 3, to consent to the indefinite continuation of this denial. The Douglas group refused even to consider amendments that would substantially weaken, much less eliminate that section. Often a declaration against compromise is merely a negotiating position. Not to these senators, not on this cause. Republican liberals felt similarly, with newly elected New York Senator Jacob Javits arguing that racial integration in schools was of the same character as the right to vote. Nolan, refusing to compromise, announced that when the Senate reconvened on July 8th, his first move would be to bring an unamended bill that included Part 3 to the floor. On Tuesday, July 2nd, as the Senate was winding down to the July 4th recess and discussing a defense appropriation, Russell rose to give a speech, Carroll writing that the only sign that something momentous was about to occur was that frugal Richard Russell had purchased a new dark blue suit for the occasion. Russell warned that the bill had been brought to the Senate under the false colors of a moderate bill that obscured its larger purpose of trying to bring the might of the federal government to force a commongling of white and Negro children in the South. And indeed, Mr. President, the unusual powers of this bill could be utilized to force the white people of the South at the point of a federal bayonet to conform to a commongling of the races throughout the social order of the South. Russell also claimed the Brownell bill had the same goal as the measures proposed by Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens to put black heels on white necks. Carroll writes that Russell's speech also had the strategic effect of aiming at the weakest links of the Civil Rights Alliance, namely Midwestern Republican conservatives opposed to any expansion of federal power by claiming that it was designed to deceive Congress into passing legislation giving the federal government more powers. Burke Hickenlooper of Iowa stated his opposition to the Brownell bill was a violation of the white racist civil rights. Russell's speech contained the following sentence, I would be less than frank if I did not say that I doubt very much whether the full implications of the bill have ever been explained to President Eisenhower. Eisenhower held a press conference the day after the speech and was asked about Russell's charge that the bill was a cunning device to enforce wholesale integration of the races in the South. Instead of replying with a defense of the bill, Eisenhower said, well, naturally I am not a lawyer and I don't participate in drawing up the exact language of the proposals. According to Carroll, Russell had wounded the civil rights cause in another way, however. His speech had shrewdly appealed not only to Republican conservatives' belief in the limitation of government powers, but also their belief in a senator's right to unlimited debate. The filibuster could be held off until the last minute, as it was no longer necessary to use it at the start of a fight over a civil rights bill, but rather to keep in reserve as a last resort in the event the bill was not hammered into the form that was acceptable to the Southern Bloc. They knew, thanks to both Russell's speech and Hell's Canyon, that the filibuster would win. Carroll writes, These facts had the most ominous implications, both for the cause of civil rights and for Lyndon Johnson. For both the cause and himself, he needed to pass a bill, needed to persuade the South to compromise. His strongest argument to persuade the South to do that had been that it was isolated, utterly without allies, that a filibuster must be defeated. That argument had now been destroyed. The South no longer had to compromise. For months, the South, Russell, had been insisting on the addition of amendments that would eliminate Part 3 and add jury trials to the bill. Now those amendments had to be added or there would be no bill. The South would have to be given what it wanted. But to add those amendments, Johnson would have to find liberal and Republican votes, votes it seemed impossible for him to find. As the Senate recessed for the 4th of July holiday, it seemed inevitable that the end of the 1957 civil rights fight would be simply another filibuster. Johnson abruptly left Washington for the Pedernales Valley on June 23rd, shortly after Russell informed him of his intention to give his speech. Some Washington advisors believed Johnson, knowing the impact Russell's speech would have, had given up and wanted to be a way to avoid identification with another civil rights defeat. Johnson stayed on his ranch for two weeks, those days being filled with what Carroll described as lolling around and occasionally floating in the pool with business meetings with KTBC salesmen and executives, 
drives around the ranch to inspect the cattle, and into Austin for dinner at El Matamoros and El Toro with his young staff members Bill and Nadine Brammer and Mary Margaret Wiley and Long Domino Games, one with Wesley West, A.W. Morrison and Jean Chambers began in the morning, resumed after lunch, and then after dinner at the West Ranch, went on there for several more hours. George Reedy telephoned Johnson toward the end of those two weeks, instructing him to read a memo that encouraged him to stop avoiding the Civil Rights Bill fight, despite how hopeless it may have seemed. The memo's author, Jim Rowe, who according to Carroll was the man Johnson felt knew, had proven he knew how to become president, warned that Johnson voting against the Civil Rights Bill would ensure the termination of his presidential ambitions in 1960, and that his ambitions would only live if he fought for the Civil Rights Bill. Johnson persuaded Russell to meet with Eisenhower, the latter two having an hour-long meeting on July 10th. Johnson had a secret Oval Office meeting shortly after Russell's. Bryce Harlow recalled the meeting as being confidential and said that he could not recall any details about the encounter between what he called the big boys. Brownell claimed that Johnson told Eisenhower that the entire civil rights bill would be defeated if Part 3 was included and a hostile Democratic majority would make his other legislative priorities impossible to pass through the Senate. Eisenhower concluded this political compromise was a price worth paying and replied, I personally believe you try to go too far too fast in laws in this delicate field that have involved the emotions of so many Americans, you are making a mistake. Carroll credits Eisenhower's statement with giving Johnson more Republican votes. Nolan changed his tune on the timetable. On Monday, he predicted passage of the bill within the week. On Tuesday, he said the motion would be brought to a vote within a week. Wednesday, he said the debate could run into September. Those first three days of debate saw amendments either suggested or formally introduced by Midwestern conservatives or Southerners for the purpose of substantially weakening Part 3. Carroll writes, the Civil Rights Act of 1957 was going to suffer the same fate as the Civil Rights Bill of 1950 and 1948 and 1946 and 1944 and 1938 and 1936. There was not going to be a vote on it on the floor. It was going to die. In a filibuster on the motion to bring it to the floor, the dam that for so long had held back the tide of social justice was going to hold it back again. Civil rights was going to lose. Lyndon Johnson was going to lose. By the fourth day of debate, the New York Post called the debate increasingly bitter. Members of the Southern Caucus rose to denounce the bill in less and less restrained terms, with Olin saying the proposed civil rights division would create a new gazpacho. Johnson knew letting Anderson introduce the amendment himself would cause Democratic moderates and some liberals to support it. The Anderson-Aiken amendment was adopted in a vote of 52 to 38, eliminating Part 3 from the bill. Johnson told reporters afterward, that the bill had been strengthened, which was untrue as eliminating Part 3 had done away with the bill's ability to provide legal resource for black Americans forced in segregated schools, subjected to segregated sections of movie theaters, and taking their meals to the back door of restaurants. Roy Wilkins, referring to Johnson, said, He won, we didn't. Johnson A. Gerald Siegel remembered Paul Douglas grabbing him by the arms and shaking him, saying, Jerry, you've gutted the Civil Rights Bill. I hope you're happy. Murray Kempton said, no single body in the Western Hemisphere has done more to abuse human liberty than the United States Senate in the last 10 years, and no member of that body is entitled to discuss the rights of man without apology. Kempton furthered, I will read to our children the names of every child born in Georgia in the last 40 years, and I will tell you now that they will recognize only the names of Ralph Ellison and Willie Mays and Hank Aaron he concluded that our children's children's children will remember poets, but they were unlikely to remember Lyndon Johnson. Carroll writes, In their fury, however, the liberals were ignoring an essential fact. Although the Civil Rights Bill had indeed been weakened, even gutted, nonetheless it was still a bill. It had not been killed by a filibuster, it was on the floor of the Senate, and the bill was still alive because of Lyndon Johnson. At the moment when he had walked over to Clint Anderson's desk, the bill was stalled dead in its tracks, seemingly beyond hope of rescue about to die, as so many civil rights bills had died before it. The full-fledged filibuster that would spell its death might begin at any minute, thanks to the important Nolan and his constant threats to demand a vote. Southern anger held in check for weeks by Russell was on the verge of boiling over.
Compromise seemed impossible, seeing in Anderson's amendment the weapon that could break the impasse. Lyndon Johnson had seized that weapon and wielded it. Equally important, he had wielded it decisively in the instant it came to his hand. He had had to wield it at that instant. At any moment, the opening it gave him might have disappeared. The focus might shift to some other amendment that would divide the Senate even more irreparably than it was already divided. The mood on the floor, already growing more bitter by the minute, might grow so bitter that no compromise would be accepted. By seeing the opportunity, seizing it, and making the most of it, Lyndon Johnson had turned the tide. He had gotten the South the support it needed to remove an important element of the bill, but because he had done so, the South had not killed the bill. Thanks to him, it was still alive. Reedy recalled, he pleaded and threatened and stormed and cajoled. He prowled the corridors of the Senate, grabbing senators and staff members indiscriminately, probing them for some sign of amendability to compromise. Johnson spent day after day arguing with one side of an issue with liberals and the other side of a point with Southerners. At the same time as he was telling Southerners that their proposed filibuster couldn't win, he was telling liberals he had counted the votes and they could not defeat a filibuster. Carroll writes, Johnson needed 48 absolutely sure votes to make passage of the amendment certain. The exact number of votes he was counting at this stage cannot be determined, but appears to have been no more than 42. To try to get more votes, he used all the weapons at his command, used them with his customary ruthlessness. The ruthlessness was usually cloaked under senatorial courtesy. It took the form of hints rather than threats. But with these men, threats were not needed. Senators understood the nuances of power. They were well aware that the man asking for their help on the Civil Rights Bill had the power to help them or not help them on other bills, bills that were vital to them to help them with committee assignments or campaign cash or office space. Johnson employed his health to get what he wanted. Mentioning his heart attack, he claimed to have no interest in another term in the Senate, let alone the presidential nomination. He claimed the new pills the doctors kept giving him were not working and stated that he didn't want to drop dead right on the floor of the Senate. One senator recalled, he made you feel that if you wouldn't go along with what he was asking, you might be murdering this man. Johnson used the liberals' fear of Russell to explain away why he couldn't do more, often saying there was no sense pushing a suggestion unless Russell approved it. He used the Southerners' fear of the wild men to the same effect, warning them they could lose Wayne Morse and others if they went too far. Johnson also used the pride of the Senate and the Senators' political parties to entice their support. After Johnson flew back to Texas, he received a letter from President of the International Union of Electrical, Radio, and Machine Workers, James B. Carey, who wrote that labor will not barter away effective protection of the right of a Negro to register and vote for labor's personal gain. Redu, who read the letter to Johnson over the phone, told him that the AFL-CIO would issue a statement similar to Carey's letter. No one had considered the Railroad Brotherhoods a potential ally in the civil rights fight as the group had spent almost a century fighting against equal rights for black Americans. Johnson understood that the Brotherhoods could turn into supporters as he comprehended the meaning of Cy Anderson's remark. The Brotherhoods had been negatively impacted by the judge's criminal contempt proceedings without jury trials amid the railroad labor wars of the 1880s and 1890s and the Taft-Hartley Act's revoking of provisions within the Norris LaGuardia had made the possibility of these proceedings palpable to the Brotherhoods. Besides eliminating Part 3, the other change to the Civil Rights Bill that Johnson and Russell favored was ensuring that anyone cited for contempt of court in a civil rights case would receive a jury trial. Seeing as how the South only had all white juries at the time, who were unlikely to convict other whites for violating black civil rights, this amendment would have the practical effect of nullifying the law. Though he supported intellectually and with his votes, Senator Frank Church of Idaho had little interest in civil rights legislation, which was attributed to the low population of blacks in Idaho. Johnson appealed to Church on civil rights on pragmatic grounds, although Howe speculates he may have offered Church a seat on the Foreign Relations Committee, saying, You knew that if you did him a favor when the time came, if he could do you a favor, this was the way Lyndon Johnson operated. There was a tacit quid pro quo. Church delivered a speech where he called civil rights legislation long overdue and called the amendment indispensable to the long-term interest of civil rights, 
while admitting it was a single step in what would be a process to better equality in America. In a speech that Carroll describes as having risen to an eloquence that gave hint of things to come, 40-year-old John F. Kennedy declared that the bill represented almost universal acknowledgement that we cannot continue to command the respect of peoples everywhere, not to mention our own self-respect, while we ignore the fact that many of our citizens do not possess basic constitutional rights. Stuart Alsop recalled that despite there being so many speeches, the floor was wholly dominated by two big men, stationed cheek by jowl on the center aisle, big, chunky, earnest minority leader William Nolan and lanky majority leader Lyndon Johnson. Nixon announced the amendment was approved by a vote of 51 to 42. Frank Church remembered Johnson as warmly and massively grateful for his role in passing the civil rights legislation, remembering he would pick you up and wrap his arms around you and just squeeze the air out. The jury trial amendment being passed, in addition to the elimination of Part 3, infuriated Republicans, disappointing those who had fought for the bill out of a genuine belief in civil rights and for its political advantage for the GOP. Some black Americans blamed LBJ for the bill's gutting, with Chicago Defender reporter Ethel Payne recalling, We all sat watching while Lyndon Johnson, the most astute maneuverer on the hill, cracked his whip and marshaled his forces to cut the guts and heart out of the bill. Carroll writes that dealing with these leaders was lessened in its difficulty by their hope that if the Senate and House versions of the bill were reconciled into one bill, and that bill was signed into law, future accomplishments would be easier. Johnson also relied on Philip Graham, who could speak to leaders such as ADA National Chairman Rao, who greatly distrusted LBJ. Graham persuaded Rao, who in turn helped persuade Roy Wilkins, who at the time was ambivalent towards LBJ. Wilkins would later write in his autobiography, In those days, Johnson was just beginning to get religion on civil rights. He dreamed of becoming president himself and knew that so long as he had Jim Crow wrapped around him, the rest of the country would see him only as a Southerner, a corn pone southerner at that rather than a national stature. So around 1957, he began to change his course on civil rights. On August 27th, the House voted 279 to 97 to accept the Senate bill with the minor change of a jury trial amendment that Johnson had worked out, allowing judges to try minor voting rights offenses without a jury. This important vote meant that the bill would go back to the Senate and the bill would not go to conference provided that the Senate accepted the change. Carroll writes that it was Lyndon Johnson who was the one among all the white government officials in 20th century America who did the most to help America's black men and women in their fight for equality and justice, and that the fight for the 1957 Civil Rights Act would foreshadow Lyndon Johnson's capacity to one day be that champion, with these glimpses of what he would eventually do, being evident in the drafting of the act, his dealing and maneuvering, and a speech he gave. On the evening of August 7th, Johnson rose to deliver a speech on the Senate floor. It was his first formal announcement that he would vote for the bill, which he argued repealed a bayonet-type reconstruction statue, and basic rights were re-empathized and broadened. Johnson stated that something even more important than legislation had come out of the debate and furthered. This has been a debate which has opened minds. This has been a debate which has made people everywhere examine hard and fast positions. For the first time in my memory, this issue has been lifted from the field of partisan politics. It has been considered in terms of human beings and the effects of our laws upon them. The Senate Majority Leader continued, There are people who are still more interested in securing votes than in securing the right to vote. There are people who are still more interested in the issue than the solution to the issue. But I state out of whatever experience I have had that there is no political capital in this issue. Nothing lasting, nothing enduring has ever been born from hatred and prejudice except more hatred and prejudice. Johnson admitted that his vote would be treated cynically in some quarters and misunderstood in others, but affirmed his belief that the legislation, which I believe will be good for every state of the Union, and so far as I'm concerned, Texas has been a part of the Union since Appomattox. McPherson remembered, when at last Johnson revealed his own feelings about the bill and said, so far as I'm concerned, Texas has been a part of the Union since Appomattox, I was ready to commit myself to him, his ambitions, and purposes for the duration.
Carroll writes, years later after the passage of the great Civil Rights Act of Lyndon Johnson's presidency, Harry McPherson, who had served in Johnson's White House, would be riding in a parade in his native East Texas. There were floats in the parade, and McPherson realized the hands were mixed. There was a Negro trombonist next to a white quarantist, three black drummers and a white cymbal player, and at the front of it all, black and white majorettes in perfect unison. There was a big sign on the side of the car in which McPherson was riding. It said, Council to President Lyndon B. Johnson. And as the car passed, spectators pointed to the sign and quietly applauded. And then the car entered a Negro neighborhood. Suddenly there was more than applause. Men and women were cheering. They were waving at the car. And many of them were holding up their arms and with their fingers making the sign of V. V for victory. McPherson's eyes met those of an elderly black man. The man grinned at McPherson and nodded his head. That's right, he said. That's right. So there had been change, McPherson would write, so much that one could scarcely remember the careful, apprehensive steps which the Senate had taken in 1957, the struggle over Title III and the jury trials, the different words for Douglas and Irvin, the praise and resentment. But McPherson says it had all started there. The great civil rights acts of 1964 and 1965 had all started there in 1957. That's right. That's right.